Hi guys, my name is Katie Moreno and I am the founder of OrganizedAdvisor.com and in this session I'm going to be talking about the scope and sequence that we use for a yearbook classroom. So chances are you are not just a yearbook teacher, you probably teach other subjects such as Journalism 1, the intro class, photojournalism, you might also be the newspaper advisor, you might teach English or art um, or math or science or history, like there are a, a number of backgrounds that you can come from as a journalism advisor and some of it does overlap, especially the journalism topics, so some of that that we go over in the scope and sequence in your book will also apply to newspaper because it's still publication staff. Um, but we're going to focus today just on your book. But I will say that at the end, I'm going to give you some resources that are for a wider scope of uh, subjects. So if you do teach those other, other subjects, there are resources there for you at the end. So to get started, um, I think that this is such an important topic to discuss because there are so many things that journalism advisors particularly yearbook advisors are responsible for teaching. And if you come from a background that isn't in printing, you don't know that side of it. If you are an English teacher, then you don't, you might not know the design side of it. If you're an art teacher, you might not know the English side of it and writing isn't maybe your strong suit. Um, if you're a math teacher, you might not know either side of it and you're just kind of sort of creative and your principal voluntold you and begged you to be this yearbook advisor. And you're like walking into this, not knowing anything and having to learn as you go. I will say just be one day ahead of the kids. That's all you need. Don't worry about it. Don't stress about it. Um, you're going to be just fine. Um, the, the goal of year one in particular is just to survive and get a yearbook done. If you don't teach things perfectly or in the right order, that's okay. It's not the end of the world. Make notes for next year and make some changes before you do the, before next year and you can do things differently. So don't stress about it. But I like to talk about the scope and sequence because one of the biggest questions that I get is, what do I teach first? And the reason is because you are teaching so many different things. As a journalism advisor, you're teaching the pedagogy of journalism, but you're also producing publications. You're teaching graphic design, photography, printing, marketing, writing, social media. I can't even read them all quickly enough as they come up. And you are responsible for publications. And so it's not just a lesson plan that you put together maybe with a team and then you present it to your students and then you, uh, test their knowledge at, you know, at the end of the year, you have a, a, a end of the year test or something, or even a final exam. This is your final exam is a publication that people purchase. And so there's even more pressure in that way. And it can be really intimidating when you look at this slide and you're like, what the heck I have to teach all of that. I don't even know all of that. How can I even, where do I even start? And so, like I said, my most common question that I get asked all the time is what do I teach first? Um, and so we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about what you teach second and third and fourth. Um, but I will say that this is a pretty basic overview. This, let me get out of my own way. Um, this is a, like you are brand new to everything and you just are desperate and you're producing a yearbook at the same time you're needing to teach skills. And so obviously there's more things to teach that I'm going to go over. And in terms of like a day by day lesson plan, um, it's hard to find that because every single program is so different. There are yearbook advisors that are teaching to really, really large staffs, really, really small staffs. Some people have it just as a club after school. Some people have three different staffs throughout the year or four based on their quarters and they get all new students and they have to reteach it every quarter, which uh, bless you guys, because that seems so difficult. So, um, you know, there's lots of different setups. And so finding a like day by day lesson plan or an actual scope and sequence is really difficult because every program is so custom. And so what I can do is break it down and then you can take those resources and build a, a program or a system that works for you. What I like to do is instead of giving, like I said, that day, that day by day breakdown, because every, every program is different, I like to break it down by topics. And so I have four main topics that I think is important for you to teach your students. And within those, there are subtopics and Honestly, there could be hundreds of them. So we want to focus on the absolute basics that your students need to know in order to create a yearbook. That doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean it's going to be the most organized method. It doesn't mean that things are going to be so smooth right at the gate, but these are going to give you the skills to create a yearbook. And at this point, that's really all that matters, right? <laughs> so the first thing that I would say is teach is photography. Then you're going to teach coverage then design, and then writing. And so when we break it down to these four simple things, there are a lot of topics underneath them, but these will get you going on, on a path where you can start producing pages and meet your deadlines. So the first one is photography. The reason we start with photography is because events start immediately, sometimes even before school. You wanna have your kids with cameras in hand on the first day of school if you can, 
and beforehand if there's any events like sometimes football games happen even beforehand like a scrimmage that gets them experience you might not use those photos but that gets them experience shooting an event and that's super valuable because it's also low priority like you don't need those pictures but it gets them practicing um also if there's like a back to school event where students come and get their textbooks and their schedules have students shooting that event you probably will use those photos but you also want to make sure that they're getting the practice behind the camera familiarizing themselves with the settings even if they've been on staff before they haven't probably held the camera in a couple of months maybe and so you want to re-familiarize your staff with the cameras and getting them shooting events so we want to go over photography first the in the first week of school if you can you want to do like introductions we're going to go over the syllabus we're going to get to know each other play some games we're going to go over like the paperwork that you know you have to get signed in the beginning of the year and then we're going to start with photography um the, a student that might not ever know anything about yearbook they need to know at least photography because those events are once in a lifetime events you're never going to get another back to school year event for the 2022 2023 school year and so you want to make sure that you have students at those events even in that first week of school where you're easing back into it um you need kids with cameras in their hands so that's why we start with photography first um, if you are, you have brand new students, like if you have a brand, a staff of brand new kiddos, like maybe junior high, or you don't have a pr primary, like a introductory class and they just sign up for your book and they're brand new, you obviously want to teach settings first. So this is like how to turn on your camera, how to put in your battery, how to replace your memory card, make sure you have a memory card, how to hold the camera, um, like super, super basic stuff, not even about manual settings or the technical parts of photography, just the basics of capturing photos with a camera. If you are unfamiliar with photography, don't be afraid or feel bad for using the automatic settings on your camera. Obviously, we want our students to be photojournalists and we want them to learn how to shoot in manual. We want them to feel comfortable with their camera and know their way around the settings. But if you're just getting started and you're looking at priorities, it's more important that you have kids at events, even if the camera's on fully manual mode and they're shooting pictures because the pictures are probably gonna turn out, they're gonna be in focus, they're gonna have good lighting uh, versus having them there, but having them stressed and having to figure out what settings to use and texting you frantically on the side and trying to shoot, they're stressed, they're having a bad experience. Their photos are gonna reflect that and then they're gonna not enjoy going out and shooting these events. And so you wanna just start with the super, super basics and review it like every single year, even if you have kids on staff that have been on staff for three years and they know what they're doing, have them teach it, have them teach it to the newbies. Um, you want everyone practicing with camera in their hands, even if they're not, a photographer because you want to breed a culture of capturing life and documenting life and that might mean that you have a last minute situation where a school photography staff member isn't available they need to be able to go grab a camera from the back and confidently be able to shoot that event knowing that they know how to turn the camera on they know they need a battery they know they need a memory card and they they'll get it you know so start with the super super basics then before you go on to the more advanced stuff, you wanna teach composition. And so that's where you start talking about creative photography and storytelling. So you're talking about the rule of thirds, using unique angles, making sure you get horizontal and vertical photos, making sure you get small group and large group and individual pictures, making sure you get zoomed in pictures and you get wide shots. You're teaching all of those things that when a, someone, a student goes to a shoot, they are doing, they're almost checking it off a list. Then, as time permits, you teach the more advanced concepts. So when you're putting together your curriculum, look at the time you have and do those first four subjects and then go back and add in advanced things that you want to prioritize for your staff. If you know that your kids have never touched cameras before, don't even worry about advanced concepts. But if you know that you have journalists on staff that um, might already, they might have their own camera, they might even have their own photography business on the side, then you can spend some time doing some advanced concepts like um, getting them to shoot in manual or uh, creative composition or that kind of uh, editing in Photoshop, like that kind of stuff that you might not have time for. It's way over the newbies heads. You don't want to waste their time, but you might have a little couple extra minutes on a Friday. Uh, in the beginning of the year, you don't have, you're not in production yet. Like you're shooting events, but you're not on deadline no one like there's a, lot, there's a lot of dead time and so you can use that time to fill it in with information related to one of these four main topics that is pertinent and relevant and helpful to your particular staff 
Okay, sorry about that. My AirPods died and then my camera died, so I'm sorry if I look different and sound different, but it is what it is. So um, after photography, you're going to start talking about coverage, and this is where you take a really deep dive into what a yearbook is and how to produce it. And so here's where you break down the terminology of the parts of a yearbook. So you look at the yearbook from last year maybe or another one you have in your classroom, and you look at the parts of it, so the cover and what's on the cover, the spine, the um, end sheets that hold the pages together, the signatures, pages versus spreads, um, and then you also look at the parts of a spread. So you look at dominant photo, the eye line, the axis, story, secondary coverage or modules, your folios, which are your page numbers, the gutter, the margins around the edges, white space, um, and then you, you talk about bleed and how to design for bleed and how the book is put together and the print process of why deadlines are so important because they have to print signatures and then they, you know, they print the signatures and then chop them off and that's why you don't want text too close to the edge. You walk them through that whole process. Um, and you also talk about the rules of your book, like the things that we cover and what we don't cover. Um, for instance, we always put candid pictures in the yearbook if we can. Um, obviously, COVID kind of changed things for a while, but the rule that, you know, the, there's obviously exceptions, but the rule is always candid photos. We don't want people looking at the camera. Even headshots, if you can get them laughing and not looking at the camera and talking to somebody and you take a picture of them smiling and talking, it's going to be a better headshot than looking straight at the camera. And you also want to tell your students what you expect from them. So you want to tell them not just what these rules are, but you want to show them examples of publications that look like what you want your publications to look like and not in terms of design aesthetics but in terms of the depth of coverage the um, design the layouts having all the elements that should be there you want to show them good examples and you also can show them trends at this point and say here's what coverage is trending um, and you can talk about your yearbook theme and this is where you want to decide on your yearbook theme as a staff or at least with your editors and explain what the theme is and you want to talk about how that theme isn't just just on the cover and it isn't just a design element but it's everything it's the entire content in the book should relate to that theme and then you want to teach interviewing so you want to talk to them about not just the actual interview that they're doing but back it up like talk about question writing and how we don't ask yes or no questions we want them to be depthy and if you're getting crappy answers you're probably asking crappy questions um, and then have them practice with each other have them practice with a friend or a parent or a sibling and interview them about something that that person is interested in because they'll be more likely to talk about it easily and then you can have them you know move up from someone that they know and they someone talking about a topic they're really passionate about to maybe a stranger so maybe a new teacher that they have this year or just someone in their class have them interview somebody but it's it's low pressure because it's not real you're just practicing and then um, you can role play that as well in the classroom if that's easier sometimes especially right now I think post COVID like everyone's so used to being inside and doing everything virtually that it's really hard to get kids to talk to each other and to talk to strangers and so role playing it with the new staff members and previous staff members and kind of showing like what a difficult interview might look like and a, and a really great one um, and walking kids through that can be really helpful to kind of ease those fears and then you also want to tell them that it's a conversation it's not a you're not being you're not grilling them for information you're not you know giving them a question and then follow an answer then follow it up with a question like listen to their their response and ask natural follow-up questions and just just talk to them just explain that it is an interview yes but it's more so a conversation that you're going to pull nuggets from you're going to pull quotes from um, and then as a staff because you know your theme and you've, you've talked about what your goals are for the year and you know your your expectations for the year then you're going to start to plan the content and this might be where you assign the pages or at least the first deadline of pages and where you start to really talk about like on that page on the varsity football page what is our content going to be what's our secondary coverage going to be what is our dominant photo going to be of? and obviously that might change if your football team ends up going to state your dominant photos should probably be of that game, right? Um, if they win state, absolutely. And so you want to plan your coverage, but be flexible. Um, but when you have a plan, then you're able to go and execute it knowing what you're looking for. If you don't, you're just like, I have varsity football, I guess I'll go to all these games. But it, when you plan it, you're already talking to the coach, you've already talked to the trainers, you've already built relationships with these people, and the coverage is going to be that much better because of that prior 
plan. Um, one of my favorite phrases is prior proper planning prevents poor performance. It's an adaptation of a more inappropriate version of that, um, but I really believe it. I mean, so much so that I would like get a tattoo of it because I really think that in every element of life that prior proper planning does prevent poor performance. And a lot of times if your students aren't producing the quality work that you're wanting them to, the it goes back to them either not feeling prepared and they didn't have a plan, they didn't know what the expectation was, or they are having some other external issue. And like kids don't wake up every in the morning and be like, how am I going to do nothing today or how am I going to you know make my yearbook teacher upset if you have kids that are struggling to get good content and produce their yearbook pages it's probably because of that lack of a plan or lack of um, expectations that they don't know where to go and it's scary to ask so planning ahead is always going to be a priority and that starts from day one like cover photography but then make start making plans and then you're going to go out and gather the content, but that doesn't stop the other two sections we're going to talk about, but you want students very early on to feel confident and able to go out and start gathering that content. So when they're living their everyday life, they're documenting that life. That is what your book is all about. It's not these pre um, set up photo ops. It's, it's just documenting life as it happens. And so when you get kids comfortable doing that from the very beginning, from day one, it's a lot more natural and you'll have a lot more content to work from instead of talking to the science teacher, being like, hey, when are you doing a cool lesson? Let me get a photographer there. You already have those conversations going from the very beginning. So then once you've covered coverage, you can start talking about design. And this is where we start getting into the fun stuff. Kids usually love this part. They want to start with this part, but the other two are really more important that they need that background because while you can make a beautiful spread, if your content that you did in the part two, the coverage, doesn't drive that design, you're missing the, the, you're missing the boat. If your most important element of that topic, the storytelling element, isn't covered in the dominant photo, you're missing the boat. So the kids really need to understand that the content is king and that drives their design. And so content always comes first and then design. Um, and so with design, you wanna start by teaching the basic elements again, just like in photography, basic elements of design. If you had a journalism one class, you might be able to skip this part, but you always wanna do maybe a refresher. So you wanna talk about color, typography, balance, you know, we need a dominant photo on the spread, we, then we need smaller elements, and white space is really important, making sure that if you have a modular book, you have bigger rails of white space in between modules, and then within those modules, you have tighter white space, so it, it groups those elements together visually. Um, and if you already have a journalism one class or you have an advanced staff, don't just talk about these in general terms, talk about them in terms of your yearbook theme. So what are your colors for the year and how are they applied? What are your typography choices for the year and how are they applied? And don't just tell them, show them. Anything at all, if you can show them versus telling them, um, do it. And if your editors can do that, that's even better because that's reinforcing that they know what they want and what they're talking about and what their goals and their expectations are. And so if you can put them in charge of like a little boot camp, then that's going to be that much better. One, it's less work for you, but obviously you're overseeing it and stepping in if they miss something. Um, but they are owning those decisions. And if the staff isn't at some point kind of like making those dreams come true and those wishes kind of come to life, then it goes back to this. And so it's like, well, in the beginning of the year, did we cover this? Did we tell them this? Did we talk about them, talk to them about their expectations? And then, you know, it can be a learning experience for that too. Um, and then you want to teach the yearbook layout basics. And so again, if you've had a journalism one class, um, you probably have gone over this, but you want to give a refresher. And again, if you can have your editors teach this. So the anatomy of a spread, you're going to have already talked about it when you did the intro to yearbook and the coverage section, but you want to reiterate it um, and talk more in detail about the design of it, not just the terminology. And then you also want to talk about your particular style for the year and your theme guidelines. I like to think of theme and a style guide as like a boat. And so everyone on the yearbook staff is on the boat. And so you're you're in the middle of the ocean in the water. You can't get off the boat. But on the boat, you can go anywhere you want. So within the boat, you have a lot of personal choice. And so a lot of times we have students that join yearbook staff and they think, oh, I'm going to design this page. They have a particular aesthetic they really like. They really love watercolor and 
handwritten fonts because that's the design aesthetic that they see on Pinterest and they enjoy, but then they get on yearbook staff and it's really rigid and modern and you're choosing a theme that's doesn't lend itself to that sort of aesthetic and they can't just throw the watercolor and the handwritten fonts on the page and so they feel stifled. And so you want to explain that the reason that we're using this theme and this design and style guide is because these are the guardrails that these this is a boat we're on the boat but within these guardrails you can design it however you want so they're in charge of their content and they're in charge of how they use the color and how they use the typography um, and you kind of explain that to them in the beginning so they aren't just blindsided by you know the fact that they can't design their page however they want um, the delicious design lesson is another um, session during the workshop and it is a it does a really good job of explaining the different parts of a layout and the hierarchy of the elements and stuff like that and then lastly you want to take that knowledge and have them practice in the software so it's faster for our brains to sketch things out on paper so I always recommend starting there like get them those layout sheets from your publisher and get them designing on paper designing layouts doing practice stuff designing modules with pen and pencil and then get them to go and translate that onto the computer. Um, the software can be a really big learning curve and it can take a lot of time to introduce them to it so you definitely want to get them in that software as soon as possible within the first couple of weeks of school um, and a really good opportunity to, to do that is just have them do like an all about me spread. So they have to create a spread with all the elements like all the dominant photo, secondary coverage, smaller photos, five to seven photos, maybe a group shot, like you can put all these different types of parameters that you would expect on a yearbook spread um, and have them make it all about themselves. It's also helpful because then they can present it and that gives them some experience in presenting to a class because that's a scary thing and getting practice for that's always a good thing. Um, but then also it introduces them to the staff and so you can include things like what's your biggest fear, what's your, what's a funny memory, and so when they uh, present this to the staff they get to know each other but it also kind of breaks down those walls and it lets them be vulnerable with each other and then they can start to bond a lot easier because it was an assignment and it was very natural instead of just coming out with you know information about themselves can just be kind of scary when you're getting to know a whole new group of people especially for newbies it's it's hard to go into a staff with a bunch of returning staff members that already have like a vibe they already gel they already you know or the editors probably have met over the summer and they were on staff last year so they really are like a click and it's really hard for those new staff members to like jump in and just Put themselves out there so an all about me spread is a really good way to accomplish both those things both practicing in the software and getting to know each other okay so after design then we started to talk about writing and I put this last on purpose um, you might have a couple of students that absolutely love writing you might love writing and it's something that is you know it, it really the part of a yearbook that you enjoy but generally most students it's their least favorite and it's what they struggle with the most and so the reason I put it last is because you want to get them confident as early as possible so if you have kids that are going out and shooting pictures and gathering content and starting to plan out their their page and then you're praising that and you're encouraging that they're starting to gain that confidence and then when they get to the hard stuff which might be writing they feel like they can do it because they've already done stuff already and so it, it just kind of eases them into that um, but also they've been in writing camp essentially since elementary school they've been learning how to write ever since then and also you might have a journalism one class where you've already taught them journalistic writing and how it's different than like writing for an English class um, but the basics are English and grammar are still applicable and so they've already heard that for so long and so you want to teach them the stuff that they don't know yet and then introduce the journalistic types of writing and so you're going to start with storytelling that is journalism 101 is making sure that whatever your topic is if it's varsity football you are telling the story of the year it's not just the pictures of the year it's the whole thing so that's why it's so important to build those relationships with the coach and with the trainers and with the athletic director and with the captains and getting to know that group of kids and their in their life and telling their story for the year um, I like to always like reiterate the story arc that you learn in like elementary school that stories have a beginning middle and an end and so you want to cover that topic with that in mind like you want it to have a beginning middle and end not every page is going to have a typed out written story I would say more often than not we don't have those types of stories anymore in yearbook traditional yearbook sometimes there's a reason to if you have a really amazing story like absolutely write the story but if your students are struggling to write it 
they're also going to be struggling to read it at the end of the year or even 10 years or 50 years from now. Um, and so you really want them focused on just reporting what happened for the year and telling those kids stories of the year. And so, you know, it, I don't know anything about what it's like to be, play football for a public high school in 2022-23, post-pandemic, and you just got a new stadium and a new coach. Like, I don't know what that's like at all as an outsider. And so you want your journalist, your student journalist, to tell that story to somebody that is an outsider. What does that experience look like? And that's their goal. Then you want to teach format, and this is where things differ from what they've been learning since, you know, kindergarten English class and learning how to read and learning how to write stories and essays. And this is where journalistic writing comes into play. So you want to teach them the quote transition formula if they are writing traditional stories. Most importantly, you want to teach them though the quote format and the quote attribution. So the format, simple things like the comma goes inside the quote, then you say first name, last name, and then said, that's the attribution. You can't say exclaimed or yelled or joyfully screamed like you can only say said because journalistically you don't want to impose any sort of um, sentiment into what they're saying just let their words be their words uh, quote format also in terms of like verbatim you can't add or take away anything from their quote aside from um and that you know words that um, are extraneous uh, but you want to make sure that their quote format is consistent throughout the whole book that also goes back into your style guide how do you attribute quotes. Do you always say uh, science teacher John Smith or do you just say teacher John Smith? Do you say Mr. Smith? Do you say the grade level as sophomore, junior, senior, freshman? Or do you put the the numbers of their graduation year in parentheses? Do you do them as a superscript where they're really small but like up like an exponent? Um, you know all of those are decisions that you need to make and make your staff aware of and be consistent throughout the whole year. People are probably going to have preferences that they like it done one way or the other. It doesn't really matter what your personal preference is unless you're the editor and you're the decision maker, um, but you need to make sure that everyone is consistent and is aware of those expectations and what the proper format is. And then you want them to practice and peer edit. And so you're going to give them maybe photos from last year or you're going to give them uh, a story from last year and tell them to give them details of the story and tell them to write it. And then you're going to have them swap and peer edit each other. Round robin editing is more for like at the end of when a spread is done, but the format can still be used where you're kind of all sitting in a circle and you pass your, your paper or your caption or whatever it is to the next person and they give you feedback and then you pass it again and you get like a couple of people's feedback on this one assignment um, and it's really fast. You set a timer for like three minutes and you just have them give feedback um, and then during peer editing, you can really get into the nitty gritty of what your staff is lacking. So if they're all writing in active voice or passive voice and they're not writing in active voice then you can do like a mini lesson off of that but until you actually get them practicing um, you remember we want to show them not tell them and so any time that you can get them hands-on in doing the activity even if it's not something you'd actually use um, you know that's time well spent so once you've gone through those four things then you want to go back in and add the extra stuff so you know what your staff needs most of all, I put these two first two in bold because they do need to be in there somewhere. Um, because you have so much content that you need to cover in the very beginning of the year, this might be something in photography that you table for like week two, week three, like after kids are already getting events. You need to also talk to them about equipment care and then uploading and organizing photos. Equipment care is fast, so it could probably be in the beginning of the year, um, but as you start to see them turn stuff in or they're leaving out batteries or memory cards, you wanna re-bring it up. You wanna talk about it again, and it might be something you address every month. Like you might have like a check-in. Um, at one point I even had a manager, like an equipment manager who was responsible for making sure that where we stored our cameras was organized. And then they would let me know like, hey, this keeps happening. This camera's not getting checked out. This person doesn't check out a camera properly. And so we would revisit that lesson um, pretty often because equipment care, I mean, those, that's really expensive and you want to make sure that they are taking care of it and doing it properly. Um, and then also uploading and organizing photos. That is something you definitely need to set up a system for. But if you don't have the system set up right on the first day of school, that's not the end of the world. But as soon as photos start coming in and they need to be uploaded so you can clear and get them off the memory card, you need to have a system. I always like having a group folder, like whether on Google Drive or on a shared server, and then having a folder for each subject. So each sport, each academic subject, each club, 
everything. And then within that folder, you have it by date or an event. And then they upload their photos by photographer. So you might have two or three photographers at a football game. And then they also rename their photos um, when they upload them with their last name as well, or maybe their full name. Um, so that way when you go and do your photo credit, then you already know who took the photos. So the expectation would be if you've uploaded photos to the shared drive, we know whose they are. Um, I also think that it's a good idea before they're uploaded, like you can upload them on your computer, but then before they go onto the shared drive, pull out all the really bad ones. Like there's gonna be ones that are the wrong color, or they're blurry, and you're gonna waste the staff's time later if you don't pull those out when you upload them. So anything that should go on the shared drive is like publish worthy photos. And that might only be 20 to 50 from each event, from each photographer, that's okay because you don't want, then you have less to look through when you actually start to decide what goes on the page. Um, then you can have like specialty topics for things that you notice your staff needs extra help on or like a refresher on or things you've never talked about before, such as shooting sports. If you have a lot of staff members that like don't, that aren't very athletic, like me, I literally don't even understand football at all. I've tried and I just, I can't do it. They need to know where to stand, though, and how to not get hit in the face by a football. So you can talk to them through how to shoot sports and follow the ball, make sure the ball is in the photo, that sort of stuff. Um, headshots can be another lesson that, uh, without instruction, seems just, you know, like um, self-explanatory. But your headshots, if you just go outside in the hallway and take a picture under fluorescent lights, they're going to have terrible shadows. Um, and so instructing kids to go, like, towards a window or turn around towards the light so the light's on their face or bringing external lights um, all those sort of things and posing so they're not just like up against the wall like a mugshot but having them turn a little bit having them laugh um, coaching kids how to take headshots coaching kids through how to take headshots can be um, a really beneficial use of your time in the beginning of the year because your headshots that are seemingly a, a really less important part of your yearbook will look so much better just because you went over it you know for 20 minutes one day in the beginning of the year um, obviously, there's lots of different ways you can get creative with photography, and then obviously we will want our kids eventually to be moving into shooting a manual. As a photojournalist, especially if they're really interested in photography, they need to be moving towards that so they can move their way through the auto settings and start shooting a manual and get confident with it. But like I said, that is like so, so, so secondary to just getting out there and capturing content. That's the priority more so than being a really technically skilled photographer, at least in the beginning. I will say also these are my opinions and not everyone might agree with me and that's totally fine but personally I would rather kid be kid have I, personally I would rather have kids out shooting events and shooting them covering them well than shooting in manual you know um, and so then with design, obviously you can talk about trends, you can look at past yearbooks, you can look at award winners, you can look at magazines, you can look at sports networks, like things that are um, produced. College, um, college pamphlets are really, really good for design trends. They're really beautiful. For some reason, that's just like an item that I love to use as an example for design trends. Um, and then you can obviously go more in depth and talk about Photoshop tricks or InDesign tricks. Um, and if you have anything in particular that your staff needs to know because it relates to your theme, like you're doing a particular photo treatment, uh, make sure that they know how to do that as well. And then coverage, obviously talking about trends. Uh, coverage is such a broad topic that there's so many that you can fit under it. Um, and really anything that I haven't mentioned will probably just get thrown into the coverage section um, because that's essentially what you're doing with your book is covering the year. So, um, And then with writing, you can specialize in and do lessons about sports writing. Um, a lot of times students struggle with sports writing because they're always right with cliches and how the team worked really hard. And that's also editorializing. You can't put opinion in there. Um, also, active and passive voice is a really popular thing that kids struggle with not popular, but a really common thing that kids struggle with. Um, and so teaching them, giving them examples of sentences written in passive voice and then having them change it to active voice can be a really good uh, lesson in, in just learning what active and passive voice is. Because I think that's something that everyone learns in English class, but they don't understand it until it's in practice. And you guys are producing something that's actually a real life example. And so it's a, it's a good opportunity to show them how active is better than passive. Um, if you do have a lot of written stories in your book, you can 
talk about features. Very rarely do we see editorials in your book, but we do want to talk to them about how it's not an editorial, how you can't put your opinion in the writing. Um, and so maybe showing them some examples of editorials from newspapers shows the difference and how one is, you know, feature stories are reporting the facts and the basics, and then editorials are opinion. And then you can do a whole lesson on headlines and subheads. That could also be a design lesson because designing your headlines is also really important. Um, but you can focus on that if, if your staff hasn't done that yet or you're using like labels essentially for your pages, you can do a whole lesson about how your headline can be attention getting and funny and punny, um, but then your subhead needs to have a subject and a verb and actually tell the person what the story is about because uh, that's something that I like. I see in a lot of your books that isn't focused on as much and there's always room for improvement there and then some other stuff you can obviously talk about social media and marketing and branding and online media if you guys are doing social media like marketing for to sell your yearbook um, you need to give people a reason to follow you and they're not just going to follow you because you're a school account and you are selling the yearbook you have to give them value and so I always try to tell staffs to like produce content that is valuable to the school population and then throw in your yearbook stuff so talking about like the sports scores from the past week you were at the game you shot pictures of it post a picture or two from the uh, game maybe the ones that won't be used in the yearbook but good ones um, and then post the score and then tag someone that's in the photo like give them information that they would be interested in looking at and information they need such as like the bell schedule if it's early dismissal or the final exam schedule or if there's a weather delay giving them the information like that teachers are usually given information faster than is like broadcast to the public and so if you as a teacher are given information that you can share um, you can put that out on that social media account instead of like the community waiting and so they start to follow you for that information uh, than even like the general like district account because it's it's faster and it's also more localized it's your school versus your district um, and then also you can teach them about finance you know this is something that it's a really good opportunity to teach students about the finances that go into a yearbook so even things like you know what is your budget for the year given from the school how much do you have in your account from past um, profit or if any are you in the red do you have to make up money and fundraise uh, do you have money for t-shirts or new equipment or on a workshop or a trip you know and talking them through that not that they're the ones making those decisions but this is their yearbook and if they want a really fancy cover they need to understand the finances behind that and so I always like to use that as an opportunity to teach them a little bit about the budgeting of it because they should be able to take ownership of it and at least understand what decisions are being made and how it affects their budget all right and so now back about the resources um, like I said this was very yearbook heavy but there's a ton of resources out there that are helpful for not just yearbook but also newspaper and photojournalism and journalism one um, and so the first place I will say that everyone should go to right now immediately is go join JEA it's the journalism education association they do so much but they have a really good curriculum um, it's a website you log in you uh, use the same login as your JEA account login um, and then it has it all broken down by different topics and again, there's no like scope and sequence in the terms of like a day by day lesson plan, but there is a lot of information that you can plug into your day by day lesson plan. And so that would be a really good resource to start with and just familiarize yourself with it because you'll probably get ideas from those lessons. Then they also have a digital media site, it's jadigitalmedia.com. I think maybe org and that focuses more so on the digital types of media so if you teach newspaper or you have an online website that's going to be a really good resource for you but they also talk a lot about photography so I would definitely check that out as well obviously your publisher is going to have um, information and resources as well they have a, a curriculum they have examples they have trends they have they up, update those resources every year and so you want to also ask your rep like where can I go for this explore the portal that they give you that when you log in there's a ton of resources there and downloads and worksheets you want to utilize those things don't reinvent the wheel like there's stuff out there for you 
Um, Teachers Pay Teachers is another good resource. There are a couple of advisors that are on Teachers Pay Teachers that are creating resources like curriculum, like a scope and sequence. Um, I don't know if any of them are free, but the, you know, Teachers Pay Teachers, the whole thing is that it's created by teachers and then you can buy them from each other. Um, so there are free resources out there, but I like to just tell you if you haven't looked yet, there are some things on Teachers Pay Teachers that are really good. Then there's a couple of websites that I think are really helpful as well. Yearbookphotomentor.com is a, a mentorship program ran by a former advisor. His name is Jonah Fisher, and he um, is an award-winning advisor. He's a really cool guy, super fun and energetic, um, really great photographer, and he has a mentorship program that your school can join that covers all your students, and it has lessons and a scope and sequence for photography in particular and it's all about making your yearbook photography better and it also includes like one-on-one -on -one mentorship with him and he'll get on zoom with you and review your photos talk about how to improve it um, if you have a really big event coming up he can talk about how to shoot for it um, just a really good resource and it's pretty affordable at the like school level because you know he's a former advisor and he just wants to help advisors get better yearbook photos um, and then there's Canva Design School. If you are not on Canva already, I recommend right after you go to JEA, go to canva.com slash education, I want to say, and go sign up as an educator for a free Canva Pro account for a lot of reasons. One is they have a lot of like resources for design. So they have a whole design school and they have videos about typography and color and balance. And so if you don't have a background in design, Go watch those those lessons and those shows. It's not about your book. It's just graphic design in general. But those concepts are the exact same ones that we use in your book, and they're so so well done. They also have a lot of templates that you can use for your social media graphics and your emails and your syllabus. Like there's so much free resources on Canva, and as a teacher, you get a pro account for free. Um, you can also do um, background removal, like if you do cutouts with like um, a headshot, and then you want the background removed the pro version has a really really good tool for removing the background and it's completely in included in your subscription um, Photoshop obviously has that too but honestly I was a Canva hater for a long time I was like no Photoshop is better I'm not gonna use that that's for like people that don't know graphic design and I was really like, cocky about it um, but actually Canva is really really good and it I will sing its praises until the cows come home because it is just that good then Adobe for Education is another resource. Even if you're not in InDesign school, even if you don't have Photoshop, Adobe for Education is, has a ton of resources on their website. So if you just Google it, you'll find their site. There's a lot of lessons and just tips and tricks about design and, and content and creation. Then obviously YouTube. Um, anything that you're struggling to learn or teach, uh, YouTube it especially photography there's a ton of resources out there for photography and um, it's a really good place to start if you're learning yourself and then you'll be able to teach your students so definitely start with YouTube when you google something because Google is own, owns YouTube um, usually the, a YouTube video will come up as well and in my experience I can learn a lot faster from a YouTube video than like a written article so I always kind of go to YouTube first um, there are a ton of Facebook groups out there that I definitely recommend joining. There are some that are aimed in particular for like different types of staff. So like middle school staffs, high school staffs, yearbook advisors, newspaper advisors, like there's a ton of them out there. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Then this is a little bit of a shameless plug, but organizedadvisor.com is a resource that's totally free for you. I have an email subscription list where you can sign up and get I say weekly, but sometimes we miss a week or two, but um, regular emails that give you what you need at when you need it, like at your fingertips. And there's also like a, a search function at the top, and so you can search for whatever you need. Um, and everything we create is, one, completely free to advisors, but also it's created because of advisor requests. So literally, your wish is my command. If you need something, I will find it for you. I might not have something personally that I have a resource for you but I have a team of advisors all across the nation so if you ever need something please reach out um, if you go to the website and you click on the contact page the form goes straight to my inbox so you can reach out that way or my email is just katie k-a-t-i-e at organized advisor with an er dot com this is the website um, and so there's also a scope and sequence page for journalism one and photojournalism like I said it does I don't have it as granular for journalism effort yearbook and newspaper but you can check it out on the website and 
underneath each section there are a bunch of downloads and so you can see that and I always am adding stuff to this constantly so again anything we create comes from an advisor request and so as we add stuff if you need it someone else probably does too so we share as much as we can on the site then um, some organizations that you should look at joining is your state organizations for journalism educators, but also for photography. Even if you don't teach like the commercial photography class, they might have an organization that you can join to go to a workshop and learn or a workshop for your students to compete in. There's a lot of different resources. I know we have one in Texas that's really wonderful. Um, and then also the Student Press Law Center is a wonderful resource you should definitely familiarize yourself with. It is an organization that is consists of pro bono lawyers that are trying to work for student press rights and so if there's ever a situation that comes up with your students and what should be published what shouldn't be published uh, especially if it relates to your job or something being censored they are wonderful and they will help you and guide you through that process as well as advocate for you if they can they're really wonderful they're doing great work and so definitely check that website out before you need it and then, most importantly, other advisors. When you are in need of something, reach out. Do not feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. If you went to my island advising session, you already heard my spiel about this, but we are social creatures and we are not meant to do life alone, and it can feel really overwhelming and isolating when you're the only one on your campus that is doing your book publication, and you get stressed out and overwhelmed, and there's so many plates spinning, and it can be really difficult to reach out to people that you don't know. So try to intentionally build relationships with people, other advisors, at this workshop and throughout the year um, as much as you possibly can to build that community around you. So when you need something or you just need to vent, there's people that are ready and willing to help you. That's all I have for you today. If you need anything, please reach out. I'm happy to help. Otherwise, I'll see you around and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye!